Welcome everyone to Creating a Family, talk about adoption and foster care. I'm Dawn Davenport. I am the host of the show as well as the director of the nonprofit, creatingafamily.org. Today, we're going to be talking about the unexpected stresses on newly adoptive parents. We will be talking with Dr. Jennifer Bliss. She is a licensed clinical social worker and director of adoptions and foster care at Vista Del Mar and Family Services in Los Angeles. We will also be talking with Mom. Molly Berger. She is a master's of social work and she is an adoption social worker at Adoption Center of Illinois. Welcome Dr. Bliss and Molly to Creating a Family. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to be separating this discussion a bit at the beginning between domestic infant adoption and either international or foster care adoption. However, there is significant overlap between the stresses for both newly adoptive parents, regardless of the type of adoption. So at the end, we're going to be talking about the tips for how to deal with these stresses, because that's where I think a lot of the the overlap does begin. But we are going to begin with domestic infant adoption. So Dr. Bliss, we know that with domestic infant adoption, can you just go through the very basic crib note version of the, what's the process like? Because I think that influences some of the stress that parents can feel. Absolutely. So for hopeful adoptive parents, the first step in any journey to adopt is to get a home study. And that's usually about a three month process where the family meets with social workers to talk about their why they want to adopt, what brought them to the table, what things they're looking forward to as being a parent. And there's a lot of other steps, but this is not a home study podcast, so we're not going to talk about that. After they're approved, there's a waiting to get matched. And that's a really hard part. And I think that's takes a toll on a lot of families. And then once you're matched, you work with an expected parent. And after the birth, the hope is that the adoptive parents bring home their baby. At that point, there's a about a six-month post-placement period where you're still meeting with a social worker and the baby, usually once a month about to make sure that everything's going well and give you feedback and support, make sure the baby is stable and everybody's bonding. And then there's a court hearing for finalization. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. A lot of times it's about a two to two and a half year process. So there are, what are some of the typical stresses that you see adoptive parents feel when going through this process? Do you want me to focus on once they bring the baby home? Or uh, yes, it. yes. Once they yes, when, once they become parents. But I do think that the process they've gone through sometimes influences the stresses they feel once they have come home. Right, and I think that actual those things that impact new parents, new adoptive parents, actually start way before the adoption process happens, because a lot of people before moving to the adoption process are going through years of infertility. Not everybody, but a big, but a large amount of people that wind up adopting have had their experience with infertility, stress, grief, loss. And by the time that they move to adoption and through the process of adopting, it has become one of the main goals in their life. And it's also something that their community and their family is probably aware of and how this is their hope and their dream. So how that can influence the stress of newly adopted parents in one way is now that this dream has happened, it can be a conflicting feeling and almost feelings of guilt if they're struggling. And Mm -hmm. anybody who has been a new parent remembers how hard that is. It's not all fun and games and you are taxed physically and emotionally, logistically. And where somebody who may have had the more traditional road of, you know, deciding to become a family, get pregnant, have a baby, and they're complaining about the sleepless nights and the this and the that, there could be a feeling of guilt or I don't deserve to complain because I've been telling my family and community how much I want this for so many years. But we have to remember that newly adoptive parents are still new parents and they're going Mm -hmm. through the same struggles anybody else. And they should have a platform where they can vent a little bit and not feel guilty about that and get the same support that Mm -hmm. anybody else would. So that's one thing I like to bring up because I think Mm -hmm. that that gets missed. You know, I I think that another thing that we hear is a difference between getting pregnant and giving birth versus adopting an infant domestically. One of the differences is that when you're adopting, another woman has given birth, another mom has given birth. And and that that mom has chosen usually, the, the process usually is that the birth parents 
or birth mother selects the adoptive parents. So there's, how does that process of not being the one who carried the child and the process of having been selected by the woman who did give birth, by the, by the mom who did give birth, how does that add stress to new parents? I think there's definitely a feeling of, am I good enough? Do mm-hmm. I deserve this? I've been chosen. So I want to step up and meet the expectations and the hopes and dreams of this amazing woman who chose me to be the parent of this child. And I think that while every other new parent has everything else they're dealing with, that's and in, a, in addition to what we talked about earlier, that's another layer of, am I being good enough? Do I deserve this? You know, she bestowed this upon me. I have a responsibility to be perfect at it. And although if we were to say that to somebody, they say, no, I know I don't have to be perfect. Mm-hmm. There is that little voice in your head that's holding you to a certain standard that maybe other people aren't feeling. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's important to keep in mind that no one's judging you. Everybody knows that this is your, you know, you're in the first few months of a very hectic, wonderful, magical, exhausting time mm-hmm. and to give yourself a break. Mm-hmm. And, and the idea in our society, in our literature, and just in, in, you name it, in, in all the media, is that Parents are supposed to fall immediately, wildly, over their heels in love with this new little being who is crying a lot and is keeping you awake a lot and is not necessarily responding how your ideal in your dreams, this is all going to work out. And yeah, but but you're still supposed to, you've been wanting this dadgummit. Most of right. you've probably waited a couple of years to get the placement. Right. Did add on to that how many years you tried to get pregnant beforehand. So how does that factor into an unexpected stress for parents adopting domestically with an infant? Well, I would like to normalize it. That even if they were to have carried this child and given birth, it doesn't mean you fall in love right away. There's this misnomer that, you know, everything will be worth it every second of the day. There's this, I would like to describe it, maybe a protective instinct that comes in that you now are in charge of this little being and you know, it's your responsibility to keep this little being alive and, you know, well cared for. But a lot of times it takes time. It takes time to develop that bond. And you're going through a lot as a new parent. And I guess my theme really is give yourself a break here because Mm -hmm. It's okay if it takes some time to create that bond. Be patient. It will happen. If you are caregiving and you are spending those moments with your child in the middle of the night where you're so exhausted, you can't keep your head up, it will happen. And be patient with yourself. You are tap into that protective, nurturing instinct that knows needs to come to the table now. And that bond will grow. Just be patient. Mm -hmm. And that, and that I think that adoptive parents tend to think, it's not happening because I didn't give birth to this child. Right. But when in reality, there are tons of, of moms and dads who d- did not feel instant love for their child that they gave birth to. Right. I hear from people, you hear, feel like a protectiveness and a responsibility. And the love grows because it becomes authentically a connection between this little being and you. You don't know this little being yet. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, you will be the recipient of their first smiles and giggles and reaches and all those little moments, your heart grows a little and you'll feel it. Mm-hmm. I have a little sign in my office that says, trust the process. And in so many ways in both, you know, family formation, however path you choose, trusting the process is an important part of it because it's a leap of faith and knowing on the other side, it's going to be okay that mm-hmm. everybody they're right in telling you to be patient. It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. We are very excited to offer you 12 free online courses on our creatingafamily.org online parent training center. We can bring you these free courses thanks to our partnership with the Jockey Being Family Foundation. You can access them at the website bit.ly slash JBF support. That's bit.ly slash JBF support. 
We have, as I said, 12 topics to choose from, including one topic called Parenting Kids with Prenatal Exposure. It is a great course and it dovetails nicely with the content you're hearing today. Check it out and let your friends know about it too. You mentioned earlier that many people who end up adopting infants have first faced an infertility struggle. Mm -hmm. They have been unable, now whether or not they have gone through infertility treatment or not, but they have faced fertility struggles, whereas they have tried, most have tried to get pregnant and have not succeeded. Not everyone, some people, for, for some people, adoption is plan A, but for many people, it's not. So how does the fact that this generally isn't the way that you've always imagined your, uh, originally had imagined your family to be formed, how does that put in additional stresses on newly adopted parents? Well, I also think there's this idea that you, one has to resolve their infertility before mm-hmm. moving to adoption. And I think that's a strong word and a high bar because I'm not sure if we ever fully resolve it. Just like any other loss that we can think of in our life, if we sit down and pay attention to those feelings and reconnect to that time in our life, we probably can get back to those emotions. Mm-hmm. And there might always be a feeling of, oh, but it's not going to impact your ability to love your child. So I think that as long as you've come to a place where your goal is not becoming pregnant or passing under DNA, and instead your goal is to be a parent, you will be able to open your heart to a child you adopt and connect and bond with the child as if you grew them. Like there, will, there shouldn't be a difference later on. It might not be immediate, but as long as you can authentically say your goal is to be a parent, and you've transitioned from the goal being pregnant and passing your DNA to that, then again, you can trust the process and have a leap of faith. One of the things that is not uncommon in domestic infant adoption is children who have been exposed prenatally to alcohol or drugs. How does that experience of parenting a newborn with neonatal abstinence syndrome or alcohol exposure, although honestly, we often don't know whether they have alcohol right. exposure, which we generally do know if they've had neonatal mm-hmm. abstinence syndrome. How does how does that experience add stress to newly adoptive families? Well, if you're helping a baby go through withdrawal and readjust their system to not having a substance that their system has their system has depended on, that's going to be a difficult time. And I would say call on the supports you can. It's not going to last forever, the, you know, but there is definitely more difficult time because this child presents with a struggle internally that they're going to go through in order to reacclimate. Mm-hmm. Hopefully the hospital is going to be able to give you guidance and won't send you home until it's more, you know, it's appropriate, but there will be a journey that first few months mm-hmm. and to turn to your, not only your physicians, but your adoption community, because you don't want a situation where you're surrounding yourself with people who are just going to put down the birth mother. Okay. So Mm -hmm. she did her best. She was struggling with addiction. She still made this amazing choice. This is not about blame or perseverating on what ifs. Mm -hmm. You have a woman with her own struggles who did her best at the time she could with the tools she had. And we don't know how we would have responded if we had her life journey. So instead of focusing on that, focus on the health of the child. She chose you for a reason. And that's an amazing choice, an amazing gift. And she believes in you. And so surround yourself Mm -hmm. with the supports you need to make it through. I think some of the complications for and and additional stresses and and additional potential things that can interfere with ease of parenting is that these babies are often hard to comfort. Mm-hmm. And comforting, and when we comfort a baby and, and a baby responds to the things that we are doing to make him or her feel better, that reinforces us and our feelings of attachment to the baby. And these babies start off with, no, it's not that you are not comforting them, it's that right. nothing is going to comfort them at this point. So resetting your expectations that this baby is not rejecting me. This baby is just struggling and having a hard time right now. I think that really helps having realistic expectations on what that experience is going to be like. And as you say, knowing it truly is time limited. 
It may not feel like it, <laughs> but it is time limited at the time. What about some of the most adoptions now in the United States, domestic infant adoptions, have some degree of openness? Mm-hmm. How does the, first of all, uh, describe a bit about what we mean by openness, and then how does that, how can that add additional stress to new adoptive families? Well, most of the time these days, there is not an intermediary third party that, that's coordinated communication. Most people are communicating directly with the birth parents, after, you know, during the match and after placement. And I think I alluded to this earlier, but there can be a feeling from adoptive parents that they have to be perfect for the birth parent, that the birth parent is maybe judging them or will regret her decision if they send a picture and the baby's, you know, whatever, not wearing socks or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's not really what we find as being the case. Although as much as we say that the uh, still hear from adoptive parents and birth parents, you know, assuming that they made the decision for all the right reasons and they're going through their healthy healing, grieving and healing process. They're not there to judge either. They're grat that they have gratitude towards not only you as stepping in because once they chose you, they truly felt like everything, there was a plan that made sense, but also that you are following up with your word and your promise to stay in touch. And that's where their focus is. So there's almost this perceived extra layer of stress, but assuming that, and and this is where the adoption professionals need to come in to make sure that the birth parent is, has a full understanding of her role as well as a concrete mutually agreed upon contact agreement where everybody knows what is to come and what is expected. So it is not these misunderstandings of lack of communication, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That's really going to help the, the stress element because, mm-hmm. you know, what we have found in contact agreements that are too ambiguous, we have found situations where the birth parent or the adoptive parents are saying, Oh my gosh, they're so cute. It's so sweet. I wish we could send her this picture, but I don't want to pour salt in a wound. On the other side, the birth parent is saying, See, they, I placed the child with them and now they forgot about me. I knew it. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's really important to have contact agreements set out, although it can feel awkward to make these decisions at the forefront of this process. It really avoids misunderstandings and hurt feelings when both parties are actually on the same page and don't know it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of the things we hear are the kind of either of the extremes that once the child has been placed, the uh, adoptive parents feel that the birth parents want too much, want to want too much contact, or the birth parents are withdrawing because they're in, in a grief process. So we hear both sides. And that's why it's really important to have the adoption professionals involved during that time. And thank goodness that we actually have to be involved, right? Because it's mm-hmm. a post-placement period of supervision. So we get to Mm-hmm. Be involved kind of like, if you like it or not, at least the first six months to help through any glitches, because this is the time that that foundation is being built for years to come, that relationship. So it's really important to have mutual respect for each other while at mutual empathy. So mm-hmm. we put together this contact agreement ahead of time. And if it turns out that she might need one extra picture a week for the first couple months, okay, like it might sound scary because Whoa, was, is this a start of an opening of a flood mm-hmm. of more contact? Probably not, especially if you honor the little increments that she might mean the world to her. Mm-hmm. So let us help because one little request for more contact could cause a major anxiety reaction in adoptive parents. Of, is this the beginning, right, of, a, of her discarding the contact agreement? And that's really probably not the case. This is her grieving time. And mm-hmm. she anticipated what she thought she needed. But she's mm-hmm. just being honest of what she thinks she needs are now that she's there. Mm-hmm. So before reacting, number one, turn to your adoption agency. There's This is not our first rodeo. We've been through this before and we can guide you through it. So you don't spiral out in the wrong direction with a woman that you really want to keep in your life mm-hmm. for the sake of your child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we also see that sometimes adoptive parents will start becoming more secure and less intimidated by wanting of more contact. Can you please, you know, start up a Facebook page so that we can see lots of pictures and adoptive parents may, we hope, will settle into feeling a sense of comfort and and an ability to to be able to uh, uh, respond to reasonable requests. I can tell you that the majority of the time that we receive contact from our, from people 
kind of disillusioned with the level of contact. Nobody believes me, but like eight out of 10 times, it's the adoptive parents wanting more mm-hmm. contact with the birth yeah. parent who's kind of like charged on with her life and just doing whatever the contract says maybe, but there, mm-hmm. see the difference is she moves on with her life, especially because she knows there's openness. So she doesn't have to ruminate and hold on to that grief. as her last attachment to the child where the adoptive parents, they don't move on with their life. This child is the focus of their life. Mm-hmm. So there's a difference there in, in pro, I don't say priority, but attention. Mm-hmm. So yes, more often than not, when we get contact questions about navigating contact, it's the adoptive parent saying, I texted her two days ago. She hasn't written back. Do you think she's mad at me? Like, no, mm-hmm. um, she had prom, you know, yeah. so it's, yeah. you know, it's more about that. Mm-hmm. I actually do believe that. Yes. When you follow the creatingafamily.org podcast, you have access to our extensive archive on many topics related to adoption, foster care, or kinship care. We interview leading experts on these topics every week and have been doing so for the last 15 years. So we have 15 years worth of content for you to scroll through and binge on. So subscribe now or follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, now we're going to shift and bring Molly in. We're going to be talking about now older child adoption through international adoption or foster care. And that will be bringing Molly Berger in. She is, as I mentioned at the beginning, an adoption social worker with Adoption Centers from Illinois and knows a lot about the international adoption process. So we'll start there. And I think you probably have some information on the foster, but, but and uh, Dr. Bliss also has information on the foster care. So this will be kind of a joint session with the two of you. And then our last session, the last section, we'll be talking about things that newly adopted parents can do to deal with some of these stresses. All right, so now let's talk about the international adoption process. Molly, can you give us just a basic overview? I know it differs by the country and, and, and other things, probably by the agency somewhat, but can you give us a basic overview of the international adoption process? Yeah, much like the domestic process, you have to get everything starts with a home study. So going through that process of getting a home study completed, you also have to have a placing agency with an agency that has a program in their specific country. A lot of times with international adoption or foster care adoption, um, adoptive families set their parameters around what kind of child that they're open to and whether that be special needs or other factors for the child in their age range. And then going through a long wait time period to getting matched with the child. When they are matched with the child, you have to go through a longer process of, like you said, dependent on each different country, whether you have to go and visit or stay in that country for a period of time before adopting the child many years or many times, excuse me, there's multiple, there could be a year or so in between being matched with the child and actually welcoming the child home into the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the process can be fairly drawn out depending on what country you're you're working you're trying to work with all right and let's see uh dr bliss let's let you talk about the typical process for adopting through foster care of the foster care okay so it the concept is foster to adopt and it's a it's a difficult road too you do need to go through the process of getting licensed to be a resource family, at least that's what they call it in California, but a foster family. Mm -hmm. And it's a longer, more intense process in a lot of ways than a domestic home study because you're taking in a child who has dealt with trauma and displacement. So you want to make sure you're prepared as much as possible. Another level to that is that you're usually expected to be a foster parent, not just straight adopt. While there are options for just adopting a foster child, it's never a guarantee because even though they say a child might be free for adoption, we've had placements where then a family member comes in before the finalization or before the, you know, before the adoption papers are signed, or there's a the last minute family finding effort. So anybody who's going to adopt through foster care also has to keep in their mind that while if they stick to it, they can adopt through foster care, it might not be the first child that, that's placed in their home. Mm -hmm. But if that isn't that child isn't meant to be their child, they're meant to be that safe, soft landing at a very pivotal and vulnerable time in this child's life. And that's the gift they're giving this child. So Mm -hmm. it's a hard road because not only is it lengthy, 
but we're asking you to put your heart out and most likely potentially having heartbreak on your journey to adopt. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people foster children. That, that's really most likely the way it goes. And then if reunification doesn't happen, then they have the option to adopt. So that's why it's a hard road. There's a lot of support from your agency. It should be. And the community is here for you. And there is a way to adopt through foster care. But you're adopting a child that has experienced trauma. Obviously, there's going to be some attachment struggles. And whatever organically the child may have come in with, whether there was prenatal exposure or anything else that could have affected prenatally as well as the early years, we all know how pivotal that is in brain development. So it's, it's a journey and it's not easy, but it's one of the biggest blessings and gifts I can think of that somebody can do. It is possible to, uh, one of the unifying things between foster care adoption and international adoption is two things. One, the children are older, and two, the children have experienced trauma, and the vast majority of both, in, in both situations, the children will be considered to have special needs. Mm -hmm. It is possible to adopt an infant, but as you point out, from foster care. However, that is almost always a situation where you're fostering first, and exactly. as you point out, it's there are legally free children, but um, the vast, vast, vast majority are, are, are They're older, older and with most likely with special needs or large sibling sets, usually at least one of special needs. But yeah, I do want to point out, you can adopt an infant from foster care. Absolutely. It's a tough emotional journey and logistical mm -hmm. journey because it might not be the first infant placed in your home and you might right. care for this infant for six to eight months and then they reunify mm -hmm. and you're starting over again. Yes. However... If you want to adopt an infant foster care, you can. It just might not be the first infant placed in your home. And if you're open to that, then you can do it. Mm -hmm. And you'll most likely be adopting that child when they're older as well. They may be in your home that whole time, but oftentimes it takes many years for the process mm -hmm. to go through for actual adoption. So I think mm -hmm. that's one common thing that we see a lot is we do have a program at our agency as well that's helping families adopt already waiting children. So children whose biological parents have already, their parental rights have already been terminated. So as you mentioned, those children, they're, they're a little bit older. Our average age is nine and a half or in sibling groups. And so I think when you want to adopt a child from the foster care system or infant, you may be placed with an infant, but by the time the adoption is finalized, it will oftentimes be a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one of the stresses there in the scenario you just described, is that you are not in control and you are you, you can't change anything to make the goal if an infant is placed with you is well any child is placed with you unless until parental rights have been terminated. The goal is to reunify and help that family heal. And so you are not in control. You are you are a adjunct to the healing process. That's that is the role that you assume as a foster parent. So in and it's especially hard when it when it's an infant, and, and and Molly, as you point out, it takes several years, and you're never sure. You think it may be moving towards adoption, but then maybe the birth parents get into a rehab, and so everybody is hopeful that they will be able to beat the addiction, as an example, or whatever the situation is. You're just not in control, and that is uh, nerve wracking. <laughs> and and it's really hard because you also have to participate in. The, uh, as part of the team, you're expected to come forward, participate, and support the case goal, which is going to be reunification initially, 99% mm -hmm. of the time. So wearing that ID, whatever, ID badge that says foster parent is important in your head. Mm -hmm. And you can't turn it over to adoptive parent until the, the case plan goal has changed. And reminding yourself that during this process, I'm a foster parent is really mm -hmm. hard. It is. Talk about as, as the as what we were talking about. Talk about stress. That is stressful. It it's can absolutely work out if you can get your brain into the place of this is my role. This is my role now, and eventually, I likely will be able to adopt a child because most people can if they continue to foster. All right, Molly. One of the I think one of the th things that contribute to a great deal of stress or potential stress for newly adoptive parents who are adopting either internationally an older child or in foster care an older child or, or even a younger child is 
unrealistic expectations. What talk to us some about expectations and what is realistic and what isn't realistic and why unrealistic expectations can set us up for so much stress. Yeah, I first want to point out that there a lot of times social workers and we talk about there's a difference between a child's chronological age and a child's developmental age. So chronologically, that child may be nine years old, but developmentally, whether that be emotionally or, you know, with their physical abilities or different things like that, they may be more so functioning at a five-year-old age. And so having those expectations of a child who is nine years old on a on the child who chronologically is nine, but developmentally may be younger, is just going to set everybody up for more stress, disappointment, frustration, and confusion. And so when you're parenting a child, it's most important, an older child being adopted, it's important to know and to really learn the child as they are and not by their age. And so what to expect based on their specific abilities, their specific mental and emotional understanding and developmental age in order to help support that child and help support you as you learn who this child is as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's, yes, it's the developmental. Also the impact of trauma. I think that we... We want to believe optimistically that love conquers all and that if we love them hard enough and we love them as if they are our own, as if they were born to us, that they will not have, that they won't have any of the impacts of trauma. Absolutely. Is that true? Even in the best case scenarios, you know, it can, sometimes we hear adoptive parents or foster parents say they had a great foster home or they didn't experience that Mm -hmm. much trauma, but Mm -hmm. trauma is trauma. And it affects the brain. It affects how the child understands and sees the world and trusts adults as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that, you know, whether and being adopted and especially for international adoptees, moving country in itself, that's a huge trauma impact on them. I think that that we sometimes expect them to be grateful. I mean, look, we brought them. We brought them here. We took them out of a bad situation. Why? What, what do they have to complain about? I mean, we certainly hear that, the, the, the gratitude myth. What type of stress does that put on families, <laughs> to say nothing of kids? Yeah, I think it puts even more pressure on that child of having that child to feel like they need to be perfect in order to be loved. A lot of times they feel like a lot of times adoptees, whether that be international, domestic, or foster care adoptees, can often feel like they need to earn love from people because they were placed in different or given up on by from different people. And I use the term given up in quotes. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they have to earn that. And so that adds a whole nother stress to the child of, I can't be myself, or I can't feel these negative emotions, or I can't wish for anything, or I can't miss my old life because Mm -hmm. they feel like they're always told, you know, you're in a new place. You're in so much better of an environment. You have better parents, whatever it may be there that inherent need to be for the child to be grateful. And and Molly, do you feel like that the, that feeling of being a babysitter or the feeling of not feeling love at first sight is even more so when you're adopting a child that comes in with a personality that is formed. Absolutely. A hundred percent. It's often a lot of times that you, this child has lived a whole nother life before you. They have likes, they have dislikes, they have personalities, they have experienced trauma. They view the world completely different from you. And so you don't know who that child is. Mm -hmm. You may see a picture. A lot of times international families say, oh, I saw a picture and I knew that was my child. And you can have that feeling, but there's a, I feel like there's a difference between feeling love for a child and wanting their best, wanting to protect them and feeling that innate nurturing feeling and being in love with the child Mm -hmm. and feeling like this is mine. And there's that learning curve. I think families have to give themselves a lot of grace and a lot of time for themselves to build that bond because you don't know what makes them happy. You don't know what makes them sad. And every day, every experience that you have is learning. And so you feel like your babysitter kind of being like, what are we doing? What am I always trying to feel like you need to be solving something or doing some activity before just going into, okay, this is life with this child. 
Well, and with and, and certainly with international adoption, you have to throw in the language issues and the cultural issues. The cultural issues can can also be a part of the foster adoption as well. But and so can language issues. But for the most part, with international, we've got both of those. And and how do those interfere, or how do those add stress? The inability to communicate with the child and the inability to understand some of the the cultural nuances that they that they're experiencing and that you're experiencing, they may not match up. Yeah, I mean, you can't when there, there's a language barrier, you can't just ask what you know. Why are you sad, or why are you crying, or how can we make this better? What do you like? So there's, you know, you have to rely on nonverbal communication a lot more in kids who may not have experienced that being growing up in an orphanage or knowing how to experience those things. So it adds more stress both to the adult because they can't, you know, the only person that they know who to ask to how to comfort is the child, but the child doesn't know how to communicate that. They don't have another adult to say, what did they like when they were there? Or they don't have somebody that they can just call up and ask, hey, this child is really in, in distress. What are some techniques or what are some tools that usually help the child? You're relying on an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old or however to relay those complicated feelings and relay it in a language that they don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, that is by definition stressful. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, whether it's expected or unexpected, it is certainly uh, stressful. I also think that when adopting older kids, it brings to the fore our own attachment styles, the way that we were parented and, and how we attach. And this can happen with infants as well, but I see it more exacerbated when we're talking about older children adoption. What are some thoughts on that, Molly? Yeah. When you adopt an infant, you kind of have a learning curve into becoming a parent where you can kind of figure out, oh, this is bringing up this trauma in my own childhood, or this is bringing up things, you know, how I was brought up that I did or didn't like. And you can have more times to slowly process that as a child grows older. But when you are straight up adopting an older child, you're being thrown into the game right away and having Mm -hmm. to figure out all of that all at once. You're figuring out how to be a parent for yourself. You're figuring out how to parent this child. And a lot of times what we needed as a child is different than what adoptees and international adoptees need as well. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be doing double duty of learning how to parent this child, but also figuring out your own traumas, your own triggers as you're parenting at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doing double duty at that same time. I want to pause here to thank a very, very long time supporter of the show and a supporter of creating a family in general, and that is Children's Connections. They are an adoption agency providing services for domestic infant adoption, as well as embryo donation and adoption throughout the U.S. They also provide home studies and post-adoption support to families in Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Children's Connection. Dr. Bliss, sometimes when Oftentimes, when we're adopting older children, they come with challenging behaviors that can be the result of of the trauma that they've experienced, and also the fact that their lives are being turned upside down uh, for any number of reasons. This seems like a very obvious question, but one that we probably should at least include when we're talking about unexpected stresses. I think a lot of parents are surprised by that. It goes back to the this is how I've parented the children in the past. They are this this new child is not responding this the way they're supposed to respond. So uh, let's talk about how challenging behaviors, even if they're not extreme, how that can add additional stress for new parents. Absolutely. Well, everybody has a vision of what they thought something would be like going mm-hmm. into it, yeah. and the difference between what your expectation is and what the reality is. The how great that difference is, is going to equal your stress and anxiety level. So as much as we can as an agency, and as whoever you're adopting through and whoever you're going to home study through, I really hope there's a lot of training, ongoing training about what to expect when you get home, which is basically expect the unexpected, because whatever you expect, I guarantee something else is coming through the door. So the best thing you can do is arm yourself 
with the tools to be flexible and to access the tools that you've learned, as well as turn to and lean on for support your adoption professionals. Because we don't expect you to know every answer or how to handle every circumstance. But what we want you to do is reach, pick up the phone when you don't know what to do. Because while you don't have all the answers, you have a community support, you have your professional support to lean on because it's going to be challenging. And it might be challenging for six months, a year, two, three years. It might, and the level of challenge will diminish, but it's never going to go away. Mm-hmm. You know, and then, and then the last issue I want to bring up of unexpected stress, and this is not exclusive to older child adoption, but I think it, it's, uh, it's less talked about and, 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 potentially more problematic. And that is issue between children already existing in the family and the new child being brought in. And obviously there are books galore about uh, when you have a new baby that joins the family. Now that is somebody coming in, but, but it's like, we are prepared for that. We, we know we have Susie becomes a big brother and there's, you know, the, there's the Bernstein bears uh, becoming a, a big sister or whatever. So we have, we expect that, the jealousies and the whatever, but that's on steroids when you bring a child in, whether disrupt birth order or not. When you bring an older child in with their own personality, their own history, their own everything, that is not only a stress on the parents, but it's a stress on the children already in the family. And and, and if our children who are already in the family are stressed, that increases parental stress as well. So, Dr. Bliss, talk to us some about the stresses on children who are already in the family when we bring a child in through older child adoption, be it through foster care or through international. Well, it's stressful regardless. And if you don't mind, can I include domestic as well? Sure. Talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, what we talk about with our adoptive families who are already parenting in domestic is it's up to them whether or not they want to tell their child they're in the process of adopting because because it could be a a process where it's a year and a half or so or more before they're matched, I can understand not wanting to talk about it ahead of time. So we leave that up to the parents. But once you are matched and you do talk about adoption, it's important to have your child understand that this woman is pregnant and she's deciding whether or not she wants to become a mommy. And if she decides that she's not ready to become a mommy, then the baby will come to our family. But it's really important not to introduce the baby in the womb as a little brother or sister, because that's not the case. It hasn't happened yet. And Mm -hmm. if she decides to parent, now you've got not only a disappointed child, most likely, but also a child that feels betrayed. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that if this placement doesn't go through, while there will be a grief and healing process for this child who is expecting and hoping or hoping that they get a little baby brother or sister, that while there's there's a grief and healing process, but not a sense of betrayal. Mm -hmm. I want to, I, I put up Doc McStuffins has a great episode about adopting a baby mm-hmm. uh, sister, as well as Sesame Street has that, mm-hmm. has one too. So they can Google that. Oh, and by the way, even when the child's in the home, until relinquishments are, or consents are signed and irrevocable, I would still say we're, we're watching, we're helping, we're caring for this baby while, mm-hmm. you know, Nikki decides if she's going to be able to be a mommy, just to be on the safe side. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now older child adoption. If we're going to talk about foster care, there's an element of that this placement might not be permanent, right? And most likely won't be. It's only about a 30% chance that it turns into adoption for each placement. Mm -hmm. So in foster care, it's important to talk to your, your children about how your family is going to help a little boy or girl who needs help and that their home is not able to care for them right now. And so we're going to they're going to come to our house and we're going to help take care of them until their home is ready again, or until their parents are ready again. So they have an understanding coming into it. One, that it's temporary because you can always cross the bridge and become permanent later. And mm-hmm. two, that as a family, you've decided that all of you together are going to help a little boy or little girl who needs help. So they see themselves as having agency as a helper through this. It doesn't mean they're not going to go through the grief process if the child gets removed. But at least ahead of time, they don't have a misunderstanding that this is permanent. Mm -hmm. Again, which then goes back to the feeling of being tricked or betrayed. There is an idea out there that you don't want to change birth order, but sometimes that's not realistic. And so I'm not necessarily an expert on how to handle that. 
But I do encourage people if they are going to change birth order by adopting a child who or receiving a placement who's older than their oldest, to look into that, to make sure that you've done yourself with the tools and supports to encounter those challenges, because there will be some things to navigate that you've replaced your child's identity, part of their identity as being the oldest child or as no one older than them. And now that has changed. Actually, Creating a Family has a lot of resources on that, and I will link awesome. to them. We have an entire section on disrupting birth order. Birth order. Great. Because mm-hmm. that's important. And that's a very real thing that um, should not be overlooked. Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes when we bring older kids in, like I say, they come with their own personality. And even when we're not disrupting birth order, they they can their behaviors are often out standing are standouts it draws attention to the family the sibling uh, may be going to school with this child and is embarrassed by their behavior molly what how can we first of all let's address whether or not that that, that this how common this is and then what can parents do yeah i think it's extremely common for kids who are already in the home to feel confusion, to feel displaced, to feel frustrated, because a lot of times these kids may not have a choice in the matter of whether they get a new sibling or not. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's about allowing the child who's already in the home or the children to have those feelings. Say, I know it's really hard when Susie does X, Y, Z in public. And I know it's really hard to have to share your toys or there may be different expectations of how you behave versus how your brother or sister behaves. And so allowing them to have that space to express those emotions and feel those emotions, I think it goes back into having, you know, we oftentimes have or have this expectation that adoptees need to be grateful, but I think there's also that expectation Mm -hmm. that biological kids need to be grateful and they can't complain or they Mm -hmm. can't have their own feelings about adding other children, not either through foster care or internationally or domestically through their family. Their world is changing just as much as the parents and the adoptee is changing. Mm -hmm. So giving them time, a lot of times adoptee or new adoptive families their focus is going to be helping the adoptee transition and learn. And so sometimes a focus kind of gets pulled away from the children already in the home. So making sure parents give those kids their own special days, their own special time and their own check-ins and not just assuming, oh, they're doing okay. Everything, their Mm -hmm. world is staying the same, even if their schedules, even if they go to school at the exact same time and their activities stay the same. Don't expect kids who are already in the home not to have a difficult time transitioning or Mm -hmm. even expressing their own challenging behaviors that go along with it. Yeah. If you think about it, they didn't have a choice. Most, in almost all situations, Mm -hmm. the adults have had some degree of choice. In some kinship situations, they may feel like they didn't have much choice, but the vast majority of of the adults in, in adoptive families have made a choice. But the kids, their children who are already in the family, even when we, and I, I think Jennifer's point about trying to give them agency as being helpers is a great one. But even when we've done that, they didn't really have a choice. We didn't turn to them usually and say, you know, you have full veto power. Now, some, sometimes you might give them full veto power, but oftentimes we as adults do not. So I think except at realizing that and not going in, assuming they're going to be constantly enamored with and willing to put up with the shenanigans necessarily of, of a new child coming in. Yeah. And if they don't want to be helpers and, you know, they don't have to be helpers, giving that power for them too of saying, you can remove yourself from, you know, if the child is, the new child is having a hard time, you can go in your room, have your own time, or you can choose mm-hmm. having, letting them have power in the small ways that they can over their own actions and their mm-hmm. experiences as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes great sense. You know, change is stressful in all, for, for all humans. And adding a kid, a child to your family is a huge change, regardless of how that child joins your family. So what can newly adopted parents do in advance to prepare and to cope in those first few months? I'm not talking years down the line. I'm just talking, let's say, the first six months before, before that child is placed with them. 
Dr. Bliss, what can parents do to start preparing themselves for the adjustment? Well, I think that as much as you can ahead of time is important. And you know what? It's different for everybody. I know some people that read a bunch of books about becoming an adoptive parent and the first few months of parenting, and that makes them feel like a little more confident. Other people tell everybody in the world, will you be in my emergency contact list if I need a break? (laughs) So you have to think about in other times in your life when you've struggled, what has helped you? Is it turning to others? It is arming yourself with education. It is, is it having your social worker on speed dial? So as much as you can use your previous experiences of learning, of knowing what helps you and what your coping mechanisms are and how you can plug in easily now when you need it for this next chapter. It might mean asking your mother or mother-in-law or father or father-in-law to come out and stay with you for a little bit if they don't live in the area or setting up those types of supports. It's also really important And I know I sound like a broken record to make (laughs) sure you have woven yourself into your adoptive support community Mm -hmm. because no one else will get it. You can Mm -hmm. lean on your best friend. You can lean on your mom. No one else is going to get it. Like up in the middle of the night, getting a text from the birth mom, you know, like dealing with planning a post-placement visit and the court paperwork and having no sleep and trying to bond with this baby who you feel, quote, keeps rejecting you. Mm -hmm. So guess what? Other newly adopted parents get it. Mm -hmm. Your adoption professionals understand. Most adoption agencies not only have support communities for you to stay in contact with, whether it be virtual or in person or whatnot, but there are national opportunities for connections. I'm actually promoting Facebook at this point because there are some great supportive Facebook groups too. And they're Mm -hmm. specific. They're transracial. They are specific to foster, international, domestic. Mm -hmm. Find your people Mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to ask for help. And this is where it comes in, where the, we can circle back to the very beginning conversation where you feel like you wanted this so bad, you put it out to your community, how bad you want to adopt a child. And now a child's in your home and you feel like you're quote failing. Mm -hmm. You're not failing, you're human. So do not be shy to ask for help and let them know that you need assistance and support. That doesn't mean you're failing. It means that not only you're human, but you're taking the steps you need to take care of yourself to make sure you're going to be the best you can be for this child. Mm -hmm. I will say that creating a family has one of the largest online support groups. And I would encourage anyone to, uh, to join facebook.com slash creating a family. Molly thoughts on what parents who are adopting internationally or through foster care can do to prepare in advance for the stresses that are undoubtedly going to come the first couple of months. Learning about trauma. (laughs) That's the biggest thing that we can, I can express to families is While you're waiting, while you're taking the time to go through the home study or be matched with a child, take that time to really learn about trauma and how it affects a child's brain and their development and take trainings about anything you could ever get your hands on. A lot of the times I hear adoptive families say, oh, well, you know, it didn't rain as much until I had a child in my home. (laughs) And so, but you don't have time when a child's in your home to be taking trainings or to go back and think, oh, this is what I want to take a training on. So do that work ahead of time. Also do work on yourself as well. Figure out your own parenting or your own triggers of what your childhood may experience. We have all of our international and our waiting child services or adopting families who are adopting from the foster care system read both the connected parent and the connected child. And those two books really help you take a look at what this child is going to experience, what you're going to experience parenting before you're in it. So at least you feel like you can have those tools in your toolbox ready for when those stressors do happen. Mm -hmm. And I will throw out one last thing. It's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. And I feel like I was part of, I'm reaping what I sowed. And that is the concept. We have promoted cocooning for, for a long time in the, in the adoption world. And, and we at creating a family, you know, we're encouraging people to consider, you know, simplifying, cutting back, staying in, being the primary ones who are dealing with a new child coming in. But I do think that we may have gone 
whether it was us who went overboard or just in general, I, I think that that I, we hear from parents who a little less now, there was about five years ago where it seemed like everybody was, I don't want anybody to touch this child other than me. Nobody can, I can't go to one of my biggest stress weight relievers is to work out, but I can't, I can't leave the child for me to go work out. They could only be, so no, grandma and grandpa can't come in to help care for the child because it's only me and my spouse who are able to tear so I, I just throw out there that there are modified ways to cocoon. Yeah, in general, you do want to simplify your life. You want to slow things down. You do want to be the ones who are caring for the child. But for heaven's sakes, they can also bond with grandma and grandpa. And they can also bond with the daycare at, uh, at, the, at the gym if that's an important way for you to get stress release. This is a long haul, so it's not going to be a permanent disruption. So I throw that out there because I don't hear it quite as much, but there was a time where I really wanted to beat my head against a wall because I would be hearing people who were doing no, no self-care because they felt like they could have nobody touch this child other than them. And huh, that's unrealistic and unhealthy. <laughs> exactly. All right. Any final words, Dr. Bliss? I would say in line with what you just talked about is that usually parenting in moderation is a good idea. So there yes. are so many philosophies, so many belief systems out there and following it to an absolute T is not realistic, puts extra stress on you, and also doesn't take into account who your individual child is and what your individual life is. So take everything in with moderation and create your collective plate of philosophies that's kind of a smorgasbord that makes sense for who you are as a parent, the child you're taking in on, and your life, and trust yourself. Excellent. Molly, any words of wisdom for newly adopted parents who are a little stressed out? Nobody has a handbook. Nobody knows what they're doing when it comes to parenting. Everybody's just trying to do their best. Give yourself a break. Give yourself grace. You're learning. The child is learning. And as everybody has kind of said on this, it's, it's all a phase and it mm-hmm. will pass as well. Thank you both, Dr. Jennifer Bliss and Marley Berger, for being with us today to talk about unexpected stresses for newly adoptive families.